I'll invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. John chapter 14, verses 23 through 31. John chapter 14, beginning at verse 23. Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you, in your great love and mercy, sent Jesus, the only begotten Son, to be the final and perfect sacrifice to take away sin. Thank you that in this great demonstration of your love, you come to us to give us also peace and joy. And so now we ask that your Holy Spirit would indeed open your word to us, because we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I don't particularly believe in luck or in uh, fate or those other kinds of words that we use to try to figure out why things happen in our lives. Uh, act, I don't know, is there any such thing really as an accident? Was it an accident that I ended up teaching language arts instead of history? My undergraduate degree is actually in speech and theater education. When I chose my major, I was very much interested in theater, but I wanted an education degree because I figured that would maybe be more useful. I was already planning to go to seminary, and I thought, well, you know, what kind of degree can I get that would help me in, in ministry? And I thought, well, you know, it would be fun to have a theater degree, but teaching is probably more practical. And then I discovered that I, at the university that I went to, I couldn't get a degree, a degree in theater education alone. It had to be speech and theater. <clears throat> so there were enough credits uh, in that process so that when I was led into education, I had enough language arts credits, language credits, English credits, that I could get um, changed my teaching credential from speech and theater to English. I also had enough credits in history that I could have taught history, and I, you know, I don't know why was it. <laughs> it, it just worked out. Uh, the school that I ended up teaching at, I, I taught a half of a quarter uh, long term in sixth grade history, and I loved teaching sixth grade history. And I think if I would have actually chosen my area of teaching, it would have been history. Uh, and that was a long-term sub on, on, on a medical retirement and at the end of the school year. So 
I figured, well, next year I'll just go back to subbing and, you know, it's waiting for that phone call every night or every morning, uh, deciding, am I going to take a call? Am I going to take a job this day or not? Uh, and I was signed up in three different school districts in elementary and middle school. And two days before the new school year started, the principal at the same school where I had done the long-term uh, science or history class called me and she said, my sixth grade, one of my sixth grade English teachers, one of my, we had three sixth grade English teachers at that school. One of my sixth grade English teachers' husbands just got transferred to New Mexico and she's decided to go with him. And I need a long-term English teacher. So I said, okay, I can do that. Well, state of California had just gone to a 20 to one ratio in elementary, first, second, and third grades, which created an incredible teacher shortage. And they were not able to find somebody to fill that position in the, in the first two months I was there. So I said, you know what, I'm doing the work anyway. Why don't you just hire me full time? Uh, and they did. Uh, and then I had to work on getting my California credential and things worked out fairly well. So that's why I ended up teaching English. Although I had taught English at a private school previously. All of that to say that through that process of teaching English, I, I have become more and more of a word lover. I, I love language and uh, we read about language this morning, how, how at one point all people on earth spoke only one language. Uh, and they used that ability to conspire against God uh, and build a tower with the purpose of reaching God. So God came down and said, this isn't going to happen. I'm going to confuse their languages so that they can't work together anymore. And so we see the power of language and the importance of language. And so then we see that again. Today is our celebration of Pentecost. Penta meaning five. So we're 50 days after Passover. And for the people of Israel, this was a regular holiday that was started way back when they came out of Egypt. When God gave to them the major holidays that they were to, to celebrate. It was cost, called back then the, the Feast of Booths. Uh, and it happened 50 days after uh, Passover. And so that is the occasion that God chose to pour out his Holy Spirit in a new way in the church. And that is why all of these people were gathered in Jerusalem. There, there were people from the whole known world that had come back to Jerusalem, Jews who had gone you know, Northern Africa, Southern Europe, probably mostly for commerce. You know, it's kind of the same thing today. Uh, when you graduate from school in Enderlin and you don't want to stay in Enderlin, where do you go? Fargo, Bismarck, Minneapolis, you go to the city to where there's work. And that's the same thing that was happening back then. People weren't staying in Israel because maybe the economic opportunities weren't as good. And so they were traveling and they were moving and they were settling all over Northern Europe and Southern or Northern Africa and Southern Europe. But they would come back to Jerusalem three times every year. And Pentecost, or the Feast of Booths, was one of those occasions. And then there were also people who had heard about this faith and had, though they had grown up in some other religion or culture, had become Jews also. We call them proselytes. And they had chosen to take on the Jewish faith. And they also were in the city of Jerusalem. And so there were people from all over the known world who had come to Jerusalem to celebrate this feast. And there are suggestions that this was some feast. It was a, a, it was a party. It was great rejoicing. And there was a lot of food and drink and, a, and just a, a religious party, but a party nonetheless. 
And God then used that opportunity when there were people there from all over the known world to pour out his Holy Spirit in a new way on his disciples and on the church. And from there, grow the church. The disciples then began to realize as they received the gift of the Holy Spirit what Jesus was truly all about. And certainly they would have remembered back uh, and I, I suspect that John, as he later wrote the gospel, had all of these things in mind. And we, and we read in our text today from John 14, the promise, where Jesus told his disciples as he was preparing them for his death, but also for his ascension, for his leaving earth after the resurrection, that the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. I, I suppose there's a little bit of artificiality uh, in using, although I, I really like using the, what we call the pericope texts. We have kind of a pre-assigned series of texts that run in a three-year cycle. And so the text that we have today from John 14 uh, might feel slightly artificial. It does have this promise uh, of the Holy Spirit in it, which applies to our uh, day of celebration, celebrating the Pentecost. But what else do we do with this text? Because it picks up the story kind of halfway through and doesn't feel like it's, you know, like there's a good flow to it. And so what do we do with it? And yes, Pete, three points. Three words. And I, I was going to, I was going to try to figure out how to do this without saying three words. And I could have done that. But you can look in your bulletin and you can look on the screen and see that there are three terms that are prominent in this text that I think are words that we have to look at carefully. These are words that are easily misdefined and misunderstood. And if we're going to understand our relationship with Christ properly, we have to understand these words and what they really mean in the context of the relationship that God wants to have with us. So, Yes, we're going to look at, define, hopefully define, hopefully look at the way Scripture uses these words. Not so much go through the text and, and, and figure out the meaning of the text, but really pick out these three words in the context of the text and, and talk about them. What does it mean for God to love us and us to love God? What does it mean that God, that Jesus gives us peace? What does it mean to have joy? And I, those ideas are, are powerfully presented in the text here. The idea of love is one that is very misunderstood in our world today. We think that to love, it me means to accept and condone. I, I think that's really what the, the world thinks of that word today. That when we say God loves you, we think that means that he's okay with whatever. That it doesn't really matter how you behave. It doesn't really... I mean, there are still some kind of boundaries. But the boundaries are more and more loose. And well, God loves you. And so, does he really condone? Is that what the word love really means? Does he really just say, okay, everything's fine. Just go ahead and live like you want to. Is love, as somebody defined it, a fluffy ball of cosmic feel-goodness? 
And, and, and as I look at the word that John uses, and he uses it over and over again, both in the gospel and particularly in his first letter, that's really not the sense of the word. We, we probably know the word the strongest in John 3.16, where it tells us that God loves the world and sent his one and only son, his only begotten son, the, the sense there of begotten, the begotten son is the only one that exists in this category for us. And the exhibit of that love is not that he, that he simply condones our lives, but instead that he sacrifices himself and takes on himself the punishment we deserve for our sin. That's what this love really is. It's not saying, I like you. It's not saying, you're okay. It's not saying, you know, whatever, whatever, go ahead and be happy. That's not what that love is saying. That love is saying, sin has separated us from God. And the only way that we can be brought back to God is for a death to happen. The consequences and results of sin is death. And a death must happen. And that death is an eternal separation from God. And if there is no death, Then, what's, then there is no justice. And, and God is a God of righteousness and justice. So when it says that God loves us, what it really means is that he steps in and takes the death on himself that we deserve because of our sin. Because he understands and knows and really designed that to be the only way that we could have life. Because then God loves us in that way and sacrificed himself in that way, you know, it's, it's really beyond my human finiteness to, to, to really grasp what this means, that God gave up himself for me to become my sin and to die my death. But that's what he did. And when we look at the text in Philippians, that, that Jesus did not consider equality with, with God a thing to be grasped. He did not consider his divinity, the fact that he was God, more important than the need that we have. And so he poured himself out into humanity and became a man. So in that sense, you know, we just have these words that we can put it into, that he gave up himself so that he could take us on himself and die the death we deserve. So because he's done that for us, then we can do that also for him. In his... First letter, he says that we don't love God first, but that God first loved us. So he sacrificed himself for us, and then he gives us, as we receive that gift, the possibility of us sacrificing ourselves for him. And the way that we do that the way that we show our love for God is in keeping his word. So this isn't about living the life that I want to live, living life the way I want to live it. It's not about satisfying my human desires, my carnal nature. It's about hearing his word, letting the Holy Spirit remind me of his word, and teach me his word and have a proper understanding of what love really is. 
And that in the true sense of love, God sacrifices himself for me and he asks me in return to sacrifice myself for him and become obedient and keep his word. The next word we have is this word peace. And as we look at the text, Jesus tells us that he gives us peace, but that this peace is not the same that we normally would think of from a human perspective. He says, not as the world gives. So there's something different about this. Normally we think of peace as being the opposite of war, and, and it is. But we need to consider what that means for us in our relationship with God. That the way that peace is achieved for us is that the war ceases. That, that by nature, we are at war with God. Now that might sound a little extreme, but let's think about what that really means. Our sinful, broken nature doesn't want to keep God's word. Our sinful, broken nature wants to live life for itself. Wants to satisfy its own desires. In essence, when we sin, we are saying to God, your way is not good enough for me. I want to be in control. Now, it doesn't work in any other language as far as I know, but the center letter in pride is I, and the center letter in sin is I. And when I am number one, and I want to do everything my way, then I am in rebellion and at war with God. And so, on one sense, we need to understand that when God gives us peace, he does that by forgiving the I and calling us to surrender. But we also see, as Jesus is explaining to us here, that peace goes beyond just that. Yes, that's the beginning of it. But he gives us two commands in that understanding of peace. And the first is, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. So peace that we get from God then is the antidote to trouble. Now we have to put this in context and we're gonna look at the context again when we get to joy. But when we go back to the beginning of the chapter, the disciples are troubled because Jesus has just told them that he's going to leave them. And they don't understand this yet, and they won't really understand it until after Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit is poured out and they're given this remembering what Jesus has taught them. But they're troubled. And I don't think that we're saying that there won't be any trouble in the Christian life, but what we are saying is that this thing that God gives us that we call peace allows us, strengthens us, encourages us to walk through life not needing to fear trouble, not needing to let the cares and the worries of the world overtake us. That doesn't mean they're not going to be there because we still live in a broken world. And we get sick and we have accidents and we grow old and our minds go away and all the different things that we struggle with are still going to be there. But because Jesus has given us peace, we can understand that those things don't have to overcome in our lives. Because we have a greater purpose and a greater vision of what life truly is. 
He also says that we don't need to be afraid. And there are a lot of things in life that can make us afraid. And uh, I kind of came to a conclusion as we were studying Romans and Holly and Jim were, were talking about this idea of eternal life that it's kind of a foreign idea in our world anymore and yet there's fear. And, and I don't know, do young people, do you fear death? Or are you so far from it that it doesn't scare you? Do you fear the consequences of sin? Do you, do you fear, you know, and, and by consequences of sin, we, we really can talk about that on two different levels, that yes, there are specific things that happen in our lives when we sin. When we disobey mom and dad and go out and do things that are wrong, there can be specific immediate consequences. But on a bigger scale, the fact that we have trouble is because sin simply is in the world and the world is broken. And yet we don't have to be afraid of any of those things and we don't have to be afraid ultimately of death because death will come to all of us unless Jesus comes first. But if we have the peace that we receive because of God's love, then we can live confidently and not be afraid. And then there's joy. And, and I, I hope I'm not stretching this too much, but Jesus said to his disciples, if you love me, you would have rejoiced. And so I, I think in there, there is the gift of joy and the call to joy. And again, we're looking at the context here. That Jesus is announcing to his disciples that he is going to return to the Father. We go back to the beginning of the chapter. And Jesus is telling them that he's going to the Father's house where he is going to prepare a place for them. And that when the place is ready, he is going to come back and get them. And if they would understand that, there would be joy. And so that is what he is saying to us. Now he has gone back and he did that a couple thousand years ago and we're, we are hopefully waiting with great anticipation. He said, I'm going to the Father. Why? Because he's going to prepare that place for those who believe in him, for those who have truly experienced his sacrificial love, for those who have received his peace. And so that we then can live in the joy of knowing that he's coming back for us. And then this last little piece that he said to them, I have told you this so that you may believe. And, we, and then we're brought back to this whole idea of believing. That, that all of this is ours. The love of God and the peace of God and the joy of God is ours when we put our complete and full confidence in his promises. And we can't do that on our own. We don't have the inborn capacity to do that. But he gives us that as we hear his word. He gives us that as we come to him in baptism. He gives us that as we gather at the altar to receive the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. We call the word and the sacraments the means of grace. The channels, the avenues through which he creates faith in us. So that we can put our complete confidence and trust in his promises. So the disciples saw him, saw, heard his predictions about his death and resurrection, and saw those, and they've shared that with us. They also heard his promise, as we have heard his promise, that he will return for us. And we are told that all of this has been told to us, so that we too can believe that we can live in this sacrificial love of God, so that we can have the peace that 
carries us through our troubles and fears. And so that we can have a joy in knowing that we can be in this relationship with God. Gracious God in heaven, we do thank you for your love and your mercy. We thank you that you call us to be yours, to live in you as you live in us. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would continue to be our teacher and our empowerer through life. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we confess our faith and we'll use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.